This is a case who hasn't had surgery. Um, and having heard that the, the previous speakers, this may actually be a case from purgatory rather than a case from hell, because um, the other ones were definitely making me nervous. So um, let's talk you through it. It's quite, a, it's quite a long history. There's quite a lot that's been going on. And uh, the reason that I chose this as, a, as an instructive or as a teaching case is that I think there are lots and lots of different issues, particularly medical issues and choice of medication. And I know that within these... Uh, within these four that most people tend to choose um, quite exciting surgical cases which don't necessarily apply to everyone here. I don't know what the, the rate of tube surgery is in the audience, but I know that not everyone does tube surgery, but everyone here prescribes meds. So um, that's, that's why I've chosen this one. And also, because of that, there's, there's something in it for everyone. There's something in it for everyone to sit there and think, what would I have done differently? And... Don't worry about saying that because you won't offend me because uh, there's a lot of the case that, I, that was, uh, occurred before I saw them. Uh, but also to, just to get our minds thinking and questioning about all the various complexities of complex medical cases. So this was a lady that when she first uh, came under the care of Moorfields uh, had already had a diagnosis of primary open angle glaucoma for a decade. She'd been seen and managed elsewhere and then moved. But by this, this stage, she was already 80. Uh, and I know that some units really don't like sur uh, surgical interventions in you know, extremes of life. Um, and also, people tend to start thinking, well, what is their life expectancy? How long are we going to keep them seeing for? Maybe we can moderate or adjust our target pressures accordingly and looking into their crystal ball. And this is perhaps a, a, a salutary tale that we have to be careful She'd already had infective keratitis. Um, she'd been described as having severe blepharitis. She'd had lenses out. We had no idea what her maximal pressures were, and she had polymyalgia rheumatica. She was being managed on um, a prostaglandin and uh, a not particularly effective beta blocker, and she was taking a lot of steroids for her polymyalgia, and she was a bit depressed because she had some aches and pains of old age, and, and she had pretty good fields. So we're starting off from a pretty good base. So uh, open angles, normal HRT, and visions of 6.9, so she's 80, she's got full field, she's got visions of 6.9, and her pressures are great. So we're all very happy with that, and we think we can see her at a nice long uh, follow-up interval, and we're not worried. So what are you already thinking? Well, you were probably thinking, did she have any systemic steroid effect? Was there any uh, contribution from her kind physicians who had been really quite heavily dosing her with oral steroids for her polymyalgia? She's a little frail thing, she's about 5 foot 5 if she could be, if she could stand up these days. She's, um, you know, how robust is her original diagnosis? Does she really need those steroids? Can she use the drops? Polymyalgia gives you a sort of a proximal limb weakness and an ache. Can she actually get the drops in? Who's doing them for her? Uh, I think we've all heard, uh, you know, about compliance this morning. She's had a poor tear film. Could we minimise her preservative load? Does an 80-year-old really need any beta blockers? Um, her exercise tolerance is going to be limited by her, um, unfortunately, by her walking, but... Um, what might we be doing with those beta blockers? And is this really glaucoma at all? If she's got full fields and you know, healthy discs, and what are we actually dealing with? And has anyone actually thought about bone prophylaxis? Because often these people get started on oral steroids by ophthalmologists. Uh, everyone diligently carries on prescribing them, and nobody necessarily thinks about Fosamax or all the other prophylaxis. So uh, we switched on to a better beta blocker, and her pressures were even lower. And she still had a blepharitis, and she still had a band keratopathy, and then she came back a few years later, and her pressure was 37. So she had a series of fields. She now has definitely got some visual field loss. And we can now say, yes, she's getting worse. And in that period, whether this was noncompliance, whether this was uh, an escape from control, um, she definitely has, yes, she had glaucoma. And then uh, under the hands of my predecessors, she had a trachelectomy because the uh, multiple treatment that she was having, she was poorly tolerating. Partly she got a poor ocular surface. And she had surgery. So now she's had surgery and meds in the other eye and topical lubricants and good pressures. And this was year before last. She's not doing too well. But now she's had a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, polyarteritis nodosa, so part of the whole spectrum of, um, of collagen disorders. And she's developed an anxiety disorder. This is a drug history. She's now on, has got some bone prophylaxis, got some colecalciferol, some calcium carbonate, 
warfarin, alendronate weekly, digoxin once a day, diltiazem twice a day, prednisolone once a day, methotrexate weekly, doxifen once a day, folic acid three days after the methotrexate, if she remembers, plus all her eye drops. So I'm thinking about, what are you thinking about? Well, we're probably thinking, that's a hell of a drug regime. Now, we hope that we see, we've got, she's got somebody to help her out with that, even with a little dosset box to, you know, to regularly d uh, dish her out her tablets at the right time of day, at the right, on the right day. That's a hell of a thing to be coping with, and she's, and she's got to cope with the drops. I'm still thinking, does she really need those beta blockers? She's still got the beta blockers. And can't we do something better for the ocular surface because we're still poisoning her? Can she actually still take these drops? And yes, it was really glaucoma, or at least by the time we've now got this far, it had become glaucoma. So she's now 87, pretty unhappy. She's complaining of ocular pain, as well as pain everywhere else, and she's got a blurred right eye. Vision's dropped a bit. I've measured and measured her corneal thicknesses, and she's now got pressures her up on the right eye. I guess that Joe gave her Diamox, which is an 87-year-old who's got multiple systemic, multiple systemic pathologies. I've, I've scratched the surface of some of them. It was a brave thing to do, but, but he thought of that, so he gave her a lower dose, and she's got a pretty poor right cornea, and her discs are cupping out. So she may well be having poorer compliance in between visits anyway, and she's obviously doing badly at the moment. So we switched the diamox to iodine, switched everything to preservative-free. What else are you now thinking? Well, drug interactions, diamox. Do we really want to be giving diamox to her? Uh, why we might want, not want to use COSOP? We know that she's got pretty awful corneas. Why didn't we do a TRAB? Well, she's got polyarteritis nodosa slash rheumatoid arthritis and a, an appalling ocular surface. Um, just wondering about her antidepressants, just having a little think about the possibility of tachyphylaxis and cross, crossing the blood brain barrier in our choices of alpha agonists. And also thinking about lid hygiene. She's still got terrible um, blepharitis and she can't really reach her lids to do any sort of lid hygiene, although everyone has diligently written in the notes, that's what we're doing. And yes, yeah, she's still on beta blockers in an elderly woman. Her right eye is holding up pretty well. And then it crashes to counting fingers. So she's now got, aged 87, a severe uh, florid bilateral uv anterior uveitis with CMO worse than the right eye. And I'm told that these are not normal by, by my retinal colleagues. Um, Pauling corneal surface disease. She is very, very unhappy not least of which she's wheelchair-bound. It takes her a long time to get into hospital. And funnily enough, she's coming back to see us and the, and the uveitis service and the corneal guys quite frequently. So she's got three different services managing what is the remainder of her, what, three years, five years of, of life. She's spending most of that time just in ophthalmology, let alone the rest of it. And, sorry, and she's now got a series of preservative-free drops, which the GPs hate because it costs a fortune, but at least we can write to them and tell them they don't have a choice. And the corneal team give her Hylofort, which is uh, an ocular surface, um, and doxycycline, which hopefully is ringing some alarm bells somewhere in the audience. And she's still unhappy. So what else are we thinking? Prizes for those, think those people who were uh, worried about the doxycycline, because that's the doxycycline, the um, warfarin anticoagulant, uh, is certainly one drug or interaction that may well kill her. Most of what we've done so far isn't likely to kill her rapidly. But the doxycycline potentiates the action of warfarin and therefore may well push her INR up through the roof and then she may well have a hemorrhagic stroke. There's a significant incidence of that with that sort of drug interaction. And I've certainly seen a number of individuals come in with spontaneous supracoronal hemorrhages, um, two inoculations, one retrobub or alcohol injection required for people who have been given uh, antibiotics that have potentiated warfarin um, and then develop a, 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 an intractable secondary um, posterior segment me mechanism, um, angle closure glaucoma, because you wanted me to get angle closure in. Um, so that's the first thing. So then we stopped the doxycycline so that we didn't embarrass the corneal colleagues. Um, can we use systemic steroids? And why the uveitis? Well, she's got an intermediate uveitis when you a little bit more closely. And now she's got some controlled um, pressures on her medications. <coughs> New infectious corneal ulcer, reduced corneal sensation. We give her levofloxacin preservative-free. This was not a, 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 a case from, from um, the ivory towers because things still go wrong. She gets 
preserve medications because the GPs hadn't changed her record. She got preserved levofloxacin because the pharmacist had that in stock but not the unpreserved. So what else are we now thinking? Well, anyone want to do surgery? What about her compliance? I mentioned the fact that she's seeing three eye teams alone. She's got multiple different, diff multiple different um, scripts, repeat medications, communication failures between the three eye teams, the rheumatologists, the GP, and the psychiatrist, I think. She's definitely getting an anxious about all of this, and she's spending most of her remaining days in hospital. She comes back in. She's now got a pressure in the unoperated, originally unoperated, I-36. Anyone want to operate? And she's fed up. So now she's on a series of preservative-free drops. Her pressure's better controlled. We had a long sit-down chat with her with a little bit of help, some hand-holding, and a little bit of hand-holding with her long-suffering carers. We've got her pressures under control. So the preservative-free worked well. The preservative-free prostaglandin was, was, seemed to be a good thing in this case. Laser correctoplasty? Well, who knows? So it's a non-surgical case because we managed to juggle and juggle and talk her into taking her drops or talking into her, her carers to taking her drops. We finally, for the time being, got her under control. We've managed to stop our corneal colleagues from killing her. Uh, and the various messages are the old messages, the messages that we always, always, always get and that I think apply to all of us, which is compliance. And I know Dave talked a lot about compliance, but that, that's, that's such a big deal that I think we can't ignore it. Uh, protect the surface, minimize the load if we can. And then also just consider those drug interactions in the whole patient where we can. They're all things we know, and I think at various different times in our practice, they're all things we forget. So that was the, that was the reason for choosing her, and I hope that was some help. Thank you.